Hello, this is Mike Trong again. This is part two of a three-part series on teaching and learning in Industry 4.0. In the last uh, video, I talked about what life was like in Industry 4.0, some of the characteristics and changes, and what has that re led to in terms of our how we live our life. In this video, I want to uh, focus on uh, education and what education uh, is uh, becoming in Industry 4.0. So let's get started. So here I have three pictures of classrooms. Uh, on the top there you see a classroom from 1839 and then on the bottom left uh, is a classroom from 1965 and then the bottom is a classroom from 2015. And one thing that you'll see uh, that is remarkably similar in all three pictures uh, are that the classroom itself has really not changed much in the last two centuries. Uh, our lives outside of the university has dramatically changed as I've talked about in the first video but for some reason our education system is stuck in the industry industrial age and in where uh, it's a factory model and so you can see you know characteristics of that would be like everybody's forward facing uh, they're lined up in rows uh, it's teacher centered so there's a teacher figure in each of these uh, classrooms. They're cohort based, uh, typically you know, by you know, the same class uh, uh, in the freshman, sophomore, junior, or in the same grade level. Uh, they're also bounded by uh, time and space, and they oftentimes in these classes are very passive in their learning. It's mostly sort of uh, listening to lectures, and you know, oftentimes these classes are also determined, um, they determine sort of a competence through standardized testing. So not much has changed in the these period. So this has led Arnie Duncan, who was the former US Secretary of Education, uh, to uh, <clears throat> make the statement about the factory model for schools is the wrong model for the 21st century. Tony Bates, uh, an educator from Canada, wrote this book, Teaching in a Digital Age guidelines for designing teaching and learning and in it he argues that technology has been increasingly influencing the core teaching activities of the university what once was on the periphery technology has become center and this has profoundly changed how we teach and hopefully how we do uh, classroom learning and how we uh, learn as well Blen Benjamin Bloom uh, is famous for his Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, most people know that in education in terms of the classifications of learning outcomes. But what is less known about his work uh, is in 1984, he uh, wrote a paper called The Two Sigma Problem. And essentially what this uh, Two Sigma Problem is that the difference between a conventional classroom where you have one teachers and 30 students and then you do the assessments at the end of the term versus the uh, tutorial model which you have one teacher to one student the difference was two um, standard deviation so that means you know a student uh, basically in a tutorial one-to-one -one, uh, classroom performs two standard deviations better than students in a conventional uh, method. So the average tutored student was ab above 98 percent of the students in the control uh, class. So uh, the idea here is that uh, if there's anything that we can do to fundamentally change technology, Benjamin argues that if we can solve this two sigma problem, how do we teach a lot of students in this sort of personalized way? And so some have started to look at different models or how to do this. So one model has been this idea of the competency-based education. So unlike the traditional credit hour, uh, which is where time is constant and the learning is a variable, in the CBE model, the competency-based model, the time is a variable, but the learning is constant. So let me give you an example. So in a traditional credit hour course, everybody is in the class for 15 weeks. And at the end of the class, you might have a third of the students scoring an A or a B, and a third of the students getting a C, and then a third of the students not passing. That would be what a, uh, a credit hour course might look like. But in a competency-based course, uh, there's really not a time-bound um, 
framework for how long a student can spend. Uh, but the idea is that every student, when they finish a particular course, they will have mastered or they would be competent in that subject matter. So let's say there are two students in the class. Uh, the student A would take five weeks to learn the two outcomes for the course, but then student B might take the whole 15 weeks. But regardless of the amount of time spent, you know, they both end up being competent and being able to master the learning. So that's sort of one model to, to focus on uh, in the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, there's also this unbundling of higher education, uh, things that are starting to change. So here you see the four components of higher education, knowledge acquisition, access to opportunities, personal transformation, cognitive and employable skills. Uh, I've put some uh, logos of institutions for each of these sections. And as you can see, you know, Azusa Pacific University, like any other traditional university, would be offering all uh, services and opportunities to students in all of these areas. Uh, however, it's a very expensive model to do that because a uh, university would have to be uh, fully uh, staffed and be able to offer these things. So the unbundling of higher education has resulted in many different organizations taking bites at different pieces of higher education. So for example, in the top left, you have Udacity, which is a uh, massive open online course uh, organization, and they offer lots of courses on technical topics, and you can essentially do these courses and learn what you need to learn. You don't have to go to university. Um, similarly, on the right, top right quadrant, the access to opportunities, um, in the past, students would have to be part of a university and graduate and have a, to access their alumni network. But nowadays, with uh, organizations like LinkedIn, you can essentially uh, connect with professionals all around the world in different disciplines. And you do not have to be part of an, any network to be able to be part of, uh, to access those opportunities. And then on the bottom right, for cognitive and employable skills, again, in the past, uh, students would have to come to university to get those skills, but nowadays they can get that through uh, lynda.com, which is basically a, an online video library. You can learn pretty much any topic, uh, technical or professional topic you want, and you can do it on your own uh, time, and you can subscribe to it for like maybe $10 a, a month or something like that. Very, very cheaply and very efficiently, you can gain those skills. And then the personal transformation quadrant, you have universities and programs that are starting to look at some of the cha uh, changes that's happening in uh, in student lives. Uh, the Minerva Project is a university that allows students to basically spend a semester in a different global city around the world. So in the course of their four years of college, they would have spent uh, four, eight, at eight different uh, global locations across the world, which is a very transformational experience. Among these four areas, knowledge acquisition ha is going to be the e easiest to automate and disrupt. And then the second would be the uh, cognitive and employable skills. And then what gets a little bit harder to disrupt uh, would be the access to opportunities. And then finally, it would be the personal transformation. So I argue that universities that want to have a sustainable future, uh, they should focus their attention on the access to opportunities and the personal transformation dimensions of the university experience, as opposed to the knowledge acquisition and cognitive uh, and employable skills, because those things can be easily automated or can be disrupted in different ways. Here's a World Economic Forum a stat about the rate of automation. So the in terms of labor and the amount of time uh, spent, uh, in 2018, humans did about 71% of all the labor in the world, and then machine was around you know, a third. But then they predict in 2022, uh, which is about three years from now, uh, machine will increase their share of the work that they will do. And then by 2025, machines will do the majority of the labor in our world, 
which is no a very scary but at the same time very uh, freeing thing because then it frees up humans to focus on things that humans do best as the video in the first part of the presentation uh, looked at. Here's a, another uh, stat. Um, this is from Forbes magazine and it talks about the automation and how many jobs it's eliminating uh, in the US and in different countries by the year 2030. You can see automation will impact China the most because of the number of people they have there and then India and the United States and so you can see rapid automation is changing and displacing jobs and you know um, what will universities do in helping um, to create the new industries. Here's another uh, stat from the World Economic Forum in terms of the job landscapes uh, in 2022 and you can see here the top emerging uh, jobs and also the top uh, declining jobs and you know, but the good news is that there are more uh, new jobs than there are jobs that are going away and so um, again for universities and, and for programs and academic administrators how do we take this information and think about how we do programming and degrees for our university when we talk about automation one of the things I always get asked is about what about the job of college professors will they be automated and uh, I found this um, from one of uh, the National Public Radio website and basically you can put in any job and it'll tell you, you the percentage chance of being automated and so I looked that up for college professor and they said that college professors have a 3.2 chance of being automated which is very very low uh, which is a good thing uh, for those who are educators because again uh, at this point in our technological development we have not reached a point where robots can start teaching because teaching involves a lot of higher order skills and decision making and problem solving uh, very very human skills that machines cannot uh, replicate at this point. And so my statement that I often tell uh, educators is that technology would never replace teachers but technology in the hands of great teacher can be transformational and that's where uh, we will end here in the second part of our talk is that um, you know, changes to higher education and to education uh, is profound because of technology, but we shouldn't fear it because it actually can transform what we do and improve the learning experience for our students. In the next uh, segment of my talk, I will focus more specifically on teaching and learning practices and how um, those things might change in the fourth industrial revolution.